Hey there. So you have a couple of options here. If you learn best by listening and seeing examples, then this is the video for you. And if you learn better by reading and taking notes, then by all means, you can turn this video off and read the Thomas and Stroneo Oloa article instead. This video is based on that article. I'm just trying to provide resources and options for people with different preferences and learning styles, so you do you. If you're still watching, though, I'll assume that you're sticking with me for this one, so welcome. This is based on the article Restoring the Self, Bending Toward Textual Justice by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Amy Storniaolo, which was printed in the Harvard Educational Review. The authors are really looking at how social media has entered the readerly experience, giving readers space to reimagine texts in more diverse ways. They talk about six forms of restoring and then discuss why it's important for literacy education and for humanizing the reader. They do use a lot of examples from Harry Potter, and I'm going to include some examples from Harry Potter fan fiction and fan art. Also, I totally rediscovered all the amazing Harry Potter stuff on my old Tumblr while I was working on this, so you'll get to see a lot of things that at least I think are funny or interesting. If you've always thought of fan fiction and fan art as like a sort of dorky, weird hobby, try to put your biases to the side for this week. We are looking at it as a form of reader response, and you just might find that you understand its importance a little more after this video, even if it isn't something you'd ever want to do yourself. Also, when those little um, images come up of different fan fiction or fan arts, if you want to pause it and look over them to kind of better understand, go for it. I don't pause and like wait for you to read in the video because everybody does it at different paces. So anyway, the pause button is your friend. Before we can talk about restoring, we have to talk about storying, which is the process by which stories are shaped and told over time. So this is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She's an amazing Nigerian author, and she says that storying is always connected to power. And I'm going to give you a freebie on your journal this week. That would make an amazing key point. If you can wrap your head around storying being connected to power, it's going to open up a lot of thought avenues for you in this class. So anyway, who can tell stories, how many, when, and under what circumstances matters. And in some stories, when they're told often enough, they can define people, groups, and even nations. And when I say that, try to think of story pretty broadly. I don't just mean a storybook, I really mean a narrative. So reflect for a second on the story you know about Adichie's home country of Nigeria. Does it include poverty, conflict, famine, violence? That's one story that's been disseminated by one power structure. But the problem with that is that it simplifies and flattens the complexity of human experience and includes many, ex sorry, excludes many perspectives from being represented. Those things might be the realities for some people, much like poverty, hunger, violence, and conflict are the realities for some Americans. But Adichie warns us against the power of the single story as a way of understanding a group of people. The same thing can happen in writing. When the same stories are told over and over again, it limits what readers can imagine to be possible. So to link it back to Rudin Sims Bishop and Walter Dean Myers and Christopher Myers, it's like only ever being able to see through one window or only ever looking in the mirror or using a really, really outdated map. It's important for readers to be able to see themselves in stories and to feel like participants in the storying process. So, Adichie talks about a Nigerian woman who read her novel Half of a Yellow Sun and who was dissatisfied with the ending. So she met Adichie and she told her about a sequel she had imagined in detail. And Adichie says that the woman, quote, had not only read the book but taken ownership of it and felt justified in telling me what to write in the sequel. She read about characters who looked like her and who had experiences that resonated with her own and that was a humanizing and empowering reading experience for her. But what happens when readers don't have access to or don't read stories that they identify with? Well, one form of resistance to that is restoring. Another Nigerian author, Chinua Achebe, explains that one option for those who have been dispossessed or silenced is to restory themselves in order to establish a balance of stories where every people will be able to contribute to a definition of themselves, where we are not victims of other people's accounts. 
To put it another way, Thomas and Storniuolo say, this process of restoring, of reshaping narratives to better reflect a diversity of perspectives and experiences is an act of asserting the importance of one's existence in a world that tries to silence the subaltern voice. So they argue that young people are restoring popular narratives in response to the lack of diversity in children's book publishing and media. Their goal in this paper is to argue for an examination of the ways that the social conditions of digital media may be inviting young people to transform the meaning-making process through collective and creative restoring practices. So essentially, they're saying that Western literacy and academia has traditionally assumed a white, wealthy male readership. Women, people of color, and anyone else on the margins have always had to restory themselves into narratives. Social media just gives us a space to do that more effectively. So, how is it happening? Well, restoring, or imagining oneself into a story, involves reimagining the story itself. Thomas and Storniolo highlight six ways that that can happen. The first and second are restoring time and restoring place. And that involves changing the location of narratives to alternate times and places. So, what if Moby Dick was set today? What if Harry Potter moved to Seattle after Deathly Hallows was over? So this is actually a very popular way of writing fan fiction, and it's called AU fiction, which stands for alternate universe. Sometimes it also becomes crossover fiction, where two stories from totally different places enter the same space. So for example, I've heard of Harry Potter Grey's Anatomy crossovers, where Harry takes a job at Seattle Grace. There was a time when Twilight Harry Potter crossovers were really big. And I probably should be taking this more seriously, but this meme example was too good for me not to include. Sorry, not sorry. Here's another example, though, of restoring time. This Tumblr user has created a story about Neville Longbottom's life as a herbology professor at Hogwarts after the series ends. And this is a good place to stop and talk about canon and non-canon non or non-canonical. Um, so the word canon means anything that happens in the official stories. So something that happens in the books or that J.K. Rowling has put out there. So, for example, when J.K. Rowling came out and said, like, yeah, Dumbledore is gay, that became canon. That became something that is associated with the official books. Something that isn't associated with the official books is called non-canonical. Um, so this is technically non-canonical, even though it draws on canon, which is that Neville becomes the herbology professor at Hogwarts. That's in the books. Um, anyway, here's another one where a user created pretend Instagrams for the characters, which reimagined their lives across time. The third way is restoring perspective, and that involves telling a story from a different character's perspective. So what would the story be like, for example, if we told it from the perspective of Draco Malfoy? It's an exercise that can build empathy and understanding, because it forces the reader to kind of think about why characters act the way that they act. And it allows readers to spend time thinking about the perspectives of characters that maybe they identify with more than the main character. So, for example, it could mean creating a whole backstory for a character of color who has a fairly minor role in the story, like Parvati Patil, for example. Here are a couple examples of readers who have done some of that work. Like when they reimagine the stories from Hermione's perspective, for example, you can see the reader focusing on how Hermione actually functions as the series hero, despite her status as a supporting character to the protagonist. Here's a comical example of a reader who made a comic about the Weasley twins in a way that engages with the story in a slightly deeper way by thinking from their perspective about the Marauder's Map, which pops up in the third book, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The fourth is restoring across modes. Whenever a story is retold through, for instance, hip hop, art, dance, or theater, a narrative transformation is happening that can make a story more accessible or available. So who has the power to imagine what characters look like? Well, the community of fan artists on DeviantArt demonstrates that it doesn't only belong to the hired illustrator of the Harry Potter books, Mary Grand Prey. In fact, Darren Chris, who's an actor some of you might know from Glee or from his other film work, starred in a student-written production called A Very Potter Musical in college that perfectly embodies restoring across modes. It's actually very funny and it's well worth a watch on YouTube if you've never seen it. Lauren Lopez as Draco Malfoy is an actual treasure. 
Um, but anyway, all of this can take the literary experience out of the classroom and into out of school spaces in really significant ways. The fifth is restoring together. This is about developing environments of digital intimacy where young people can create meaning together. It's specifically about social media, where participatory cultures have developed and where everyday citizens have an expanded capacity to communicate and circulate their ideas. It's actually really similar to the oral storytelling culture that birthed the fairy tale tradition. One example is the hashtag, we need diverse books, where readers sometimes offer alternate readings of the quote, normal families portrayed in most published books for youth. One great example is this Tumblr thread. Lots of users are contributing to one user's idea about the wizarding community in the Middle East. They're building on each other's ideas and constructing a restoring community in the process. The sixth is restoring identity, and this involves changing the identities of characters to more accurately reflect the diversity of the world, to blur boundaries between traditional categories, or to create characters who more closely mirror the reader's identity. Keywords here are race bending, gender bending, and queer bending, which are used to describe restoring in which characters' races, genders, or sexualities are altered from the canon. It's especially popular in fan art, but queer bending actually also appears very frequently in fan fiction, especially in what's called slash fiction. So let's take Harry slash Draco fanfic as an example. That's going to be a story in which Harry and Draco are in a relationship together. Both characters have been queer bent, and it gives readers who don't often see their sexualities represented in literature to restore themselves into the pages of their favorite books. So, what does restoring really do for readers? It gives them a place to create windows and mirrors where they didn't exist before, and to resist being victims of other people's accounts. It shifts the focus from the privileged voices that have traditionally narrated or published stories and opens spaces for more perspectives to emerge. And it doesn't just have to happen in social media spaces. Teachers can invite students to restory, maybe helping them engage with literature in new ways and to think seriously about the power structures that exist both in the world and around storytelling. It's a way for readers to assert that their lives matter, and that's a big deal. Oh, by the way, someone always asks how authors feel about restoring. I'm sure that it varies based on the author, but I know that J.K. Rowling has been supportive of her readers restoring. Honestly, though, a better answer to the question, how do authors feel about it, is it doesn't really matter, at least not to this discussion. Because this is about how readers are creating spaces for themselves in books, and authors honestly get royalties either way. So your experiences with Pottermore this week will probably draw on restoring in some regard. Try to keep it in mind, at least, as you're exploring. I'm really excited to read everyone's responses. It's really one of my favorite topics, and I hope you all have fun with it. Cheers.